pause the video, give this a go yourself first. All I want you to do is this column, this column, and this column. Give me a list of all the malware, all the cyber attacks, and all the social engineering. Pause the video, good luck. I'm gonna do a solution right now. So let's do this as different columns. So we'll go to virus, worm, adware, Trojan horse, ransomware, spyware. Those would be my malware. In terms of cyber attacks, hacking, DDoS, uh, brute force attack, and data interception. That's also known as man in the middle, but don't worry too much about that. Social engineering. We've got farming and fishing. Let's put this on the next page. Okay. I would like for you now to give a clear description of each one. Pause the video. Give it a go yourself first. Okay. So what is it? Or you can argue, how does it work? So again, if you didn't put how it really works, pause the video, amend. Malicious soft code will do. Attaches itself to files, replicates, malicious code doesn't need a host file or should I say, yep doesn't need a host file needs human activation doesn't need human activation can jump from device to device Adware, malicious code, displays unwanted adverts. Trojan horse, malicious code, enters computer disguised as legitimate app. When we say app, we're going to use the word application. Think of like Minecraft, you download in Minecraft. It looks real. Opens up ports to hackers to get onto the system. So what it does, it opens up doors to your computer. Those doors are called ports. Hackers can then get onto your computer and cause damage. Ransomware, malicious code. What well, it does encrypts your data. Forces you to, and this is gonna go into what it can lead to, pay ransom to have it decrypted. Spyware. Malicious code. Key logs your keystrokes on a keyboard send to a third party like a hacker so whatever you're typing on a keyboard it sends that to a hacker hacking unauthorized access to a computer that is hacking someone who's gained unauthorized access to a computer DDoS, which stands for Distributed Denial of Service Attack. What happens is bots are used to send many requests to a server. Server cannot cope with traffic. 
server crashes, goes offline. I'm gonna add to this, these bots are controlled by a singular group of people and can be from all over the world. So what happens is something like this, a third party, this is like an individual or like a hacker group, they basically get loads of bots. These bots, they can take over other people's computers quite easily. And it creates like a network of bots. This could be thousands and thousands and thousands. What they'll do is they'll send loads of requests to the server. The server fails because it can't deal with it. That means that other people can't access that website, like taking down Netflix. So it's these bots, which are basically these hackers sending malware to turn these computers into bots to then attack a server. So I'm going to put the bots on network. I'm going to put the bots you um, are taken over by malware. Other people cannot access server. Okay, brute force attack. Hacker uses a dictionary file and and a application. It will go through every single possible combination of username slash email and password. In the dictionary file, will alert the hacker to the correct combination. So it's basically going through every single possible password, typing it in and seeing which one's correct. But it does it really, really quick. And data interception, data packets sent from one destination to another. They are intercepted by a third party, like a hacker. Hacker can then, with the packet, view sensitive data being sent. Okay, see if you can give me a little bit about what each one can lead to. Pause the video, give it a go. Okay, so computer, uh, deleted files, corrupted files. So devices, as it can jump, it can delete files, it can corrupt files. Adware. Well, adware is a little bit different because adware could lead to other malware, such as viruses and worms. Um, revenue for businesses, because if you click on an ad, they get money for it. So if you try and close it down, so if you've been on a website, like a, video, a movie streaming website, and you try and click on play, and it comes up with loads of ads because that's how they make the money, like one, two, three movies. You're actually giving them money. It could obviously slow down your computer because it takes up memory. It could also um, lead to privacy concerns because they could get information about you to do targeted ads. Trojan horse. Well, it could lead to unauthorized access. Unauthorized access could lead to um, data theft, and data corruption. It could lead to um, people. I'm going to put data corruption slash loss. It could lead to unauthorized access control of your computer. Ransomware. Well, if you don't pay. It could be data loss, financial loss, because you can't do your work, etc. Which, because if your data remains encrypted, oh dear. 
Um, well, access to sensitive data, because we see what you're typing. Access to passwords, as an example, could lead to them um, gaining personal information about you. So all of these are different potential what it could lead to. Hacking. Well, this is going to be the same as really Trojan Horse. I'm going to just copy and paste that to that. If it DDoS, server unresponsive. So website will be down. For business, it will mean financial loss. Or loss of trust from customers. For a customer, for a user, for a user cannot access a service like Netflix because it's down. Brute force attack, well, it will lead to all the things that hacking would lead to, data theft, corruption, because they get access to your information. Data interception, again, access to personal data such as financial, passwords, it could lead to identity theft. I'm going to put that for any other ones where mm, hacking, you could argue, to gain information, data theft, identity theft. Uh, Trojan horse, identity theft, by getting your data. And then we, ooh, I completely forgot about the social engineering. So let's do what it is, what it can lead to together. So what is farming? Malicious code on a server or hard drive redirects you to a legitimate looking website. It is fake. Email with link. Oh, I'm going to put legitimate looking email. Let's do that. When clicked, we'll take you to a legitimate looking website and ask you to put in your personal details. Same with this. This is fake and we'll ask you to put in your personal details. What can it lead to? Identity theft. Uh, personal information being accessed, stored, used. And the same for phishing. Okay, viruses, how to prevent them. Firewall antivirus software. Those would be your go. Same with a worm. Adware, anti-adware software. So there are actual software out there for adware. Trojan horse, anti-virus software, that could actually prevent it. Updating software. I'll explain that in a bit. Um, we then got firewall. Those will be good go-tos. Ransomware. You can talk about things such as access levels, firewall, updating software, and again, antivirus. You'll notice there's quite a lot of similarities within these. With you can do things such as anti-spyware software, firewall, let's try firewall. Anything which requires, requires two-step verification or authentication, and we can actually probably put that with other things like this and this. 
I will talk about these as a separate question later. How to prevent, well, I'm gonna use these. I'm gonna get rid of access levels because it's not gonna be my top updating software. I'm gonna get rid of, I'm gonna get rid of antivirus. I'm gonna do biometric passwords. That's gonna be key. And I'm gonna do strong password policy. How to prevent DDoS firewall. Contact ISP to block IP addresses. You could also mention DDoS serve I'm going to use mitigation services. This is more of an A-level answer, but it still looks impressive. That will divert suspicious DDoS traffic away from your web server. I will talk about these, as I keep saying, in a different um, video. Brute force attacks, strong password policy. That'll be one. two-step slash factor verification slash authentication. You could talk about um, locking accounts after a number of attempts. You know, if you try and log onto a website like more than four times with the wrong password, it'll lock the account. And you've got data interception where we can have to prevent it encrypted data so people if they intercept it they can't read it secure network so make sure that when we are sending data it's secure in the first place and we've got firewalls now keep in mind that you can't really repeat if you get asked let's say prevent three ways of virus well prevent a virus prevent a worm prevent an ad where give one way to do each one you can't repeat firewall twice or antivirus twice so you have to be selective with what you choose okay what i'm going to do now is i'm going to ask you a slightly different question oh i keep forgetting social engineering how do we prevent social engineering well to prevent farming what we can do is the following so for farming Check the URL for HTTPS. Do not click on suspicious links. Those would be a good to go to's. I would also use antivirus software to check to see if you've got any malicious code on your hard drive, which is causing the farming. Phishing, check the link and the email and the website it sends you carefully. Report links to ISP or put in spam folder. So if you see something suspicious, put it into your spam. Yeah, those will be my, again, big go-tos. All right. Okay, what I'd like you to do, as always, is pause the video, give us a go. What I'd like you to do is talk about how each one of these works. See if you can come up with at least three things to say about each one of these. Okay, so let's do it. A firewall, how does that work? Well, you can talk about it monitors incoming and outgoing traffic you can talk about it checks traffic I might need to make this a little bit lower and lower okay it checks traffic to see if it meets criteria you can put rules also we can also mention 
blocks traffic that fails to meet rules or criteria and you could also mention logs or traffic that'll be my least favorite thing to say though so any three from there would be useful i'm now going to talk about anti-spyware so continuously scans computer for viruses or you can just say just scans computer now it has a record or a list of all known viruses it quarantines when virus is found it needs to, okay I, I would mention but not in this answer that it needs to be updated it needs to be updated to update this record of all viruses because you get new viruses but that isn't how it really works we're just talking about it scans your computer it sees a virus it checks well it checks it against a list Oh, it matches this one, so it's a virus, it's put into quarantine. But also, it checks data before you download. So if I'm downloading a game, it will check it first. Does it have a virus? If virus prevents download, or it might give me a warning. So this question wasn't really talking about updating antivirus. So if you mention anything about that, that would be a slightly different question. That would be, why is it important to keep antivirus software updated? All right, let's talk about strong password. Force users to have a strong PW means password, which And then I might give an example. Contains lower, upper, case, and symbols, and longer than a certain length. So I might give an example, but I'm not going to because I can't be bothered of a strong password. In fact, I will do. L E V one N at R dot three. Also, I can mention not to have consecutive numbers or real words. But also with a strong password policy, force users to change password. A lot of companies don't do this. Like, I can't remember the last time Netflix forced me to change my password. But it's good practice for them to do that. And finally, lock out users after certain number of attempts so if i've got a website and you try and log on to it more than four times and you keep getting it wrong it locks you out okay let's move it on let's do biometrics so with biometrics how does that work data is unique to individual that is entered i.e. fingerprint that should say entered I apologize for my writing but this is what happens when you're dyslexic and you can't write difficult to replicate then so it's difficult to share 
will replicate. And then I'm also going to say lock out after a certain number of attempts. So if you try and use a fingerprint scanner like three times and you keep getting it wrong, you never do it. It'll just lock you out. I'm not going to do updating software yet. Let's do two factor authentication and let's just get rid of this firewall garbage here. Okay. So the way this works, extra data or confirmation is sent to device. So basically it's like when you log into a website, it says, okay, we're going to send you an email to your email to confirm. So if I try and get Netflix, it'll say, okay, we're going to send you an email, just click confirm, or send you a message to your phone saying, is it you? Makes it harder for hackers. So it has to come from authorized source. What do I mean by that? Well, here's the thing. If it sends something to my email, well, I'm going to put email here. The website is expecting it to come from my email, the confirmation. So it's hard for a hacker because you've got to hack, like, let's imagine it was Netflix and someone's hacked my Netflix account. They would have had to hack my Netflix and my email to be able to do this. That's two things they've got to hack. So it's going to come from an authorized source. Otherwise rejected. So if they've tried to fake the email confirmation, it'll be rejected. We then got anti-spyware. And this is easy because it's very similar to anti-virus or anti-adware, it's the same. Scans computer for either spyware or adware. So I'm going to do an array. Removes or quarantines if found. can prevent spyware or adware, depending on what we're talking about, being downloaded. And finally, updating software. Provide, when you update software, it provides normally a patch such a fix to security vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities. I.e. I download a banking app. Day four of them releasing it onto the market, they think, oh my gosh, there's a gap in our code, which means that hackers, if they find it, could get onto the system. So they quickly release an update. They well, have to code the update and release it, which means that hopefully the gap gets taken away. So that's why updating software is important. If you think about Trojan Horse, that gets onto your computer and it opens up vulnerabilities on your system. So if you can close down those vulnerabilities quickly, Brilliant. Same with hackers. Hackers can get onto your computer through software, through games and things like that. Because if there's vulnerabilities in the code, they can get access to it. So, just a quick recall. We talked about firewalls, antivirus. 
there's really not three things you can talk about for updating software really but anti-spyware anti-adware depends which one you're talking about biometrics two-factor authentication perfect so I've got a quick two quick fire questions for you why report to ISP phishing emails what can they do well what we can do is block those emails and they'll block it for everybody so if I report something on Gmail it'll block it for everyone who's got a Gmail okay if I'm experiencing a um, DDoS on my website through bots attacking my website why would it be useful for me to block the IP address well that'll be because they'll probably come from similar IP addresses if I'm seeing that they're coming from the same or there's lots of repeated from the same IP address by me blocking it they can't send a request to my website so we can't try and DDoS it I'm going to hold it there okay so this question is about SSL is to do with art gallery so let's talk about the process but pause the video give it a go yourself first all right describe the process of SSL and how it provides a secure um, connection I'm going to use the art gallery scenario within my answer but to begin with SSL is a secure protocol that will give me a mark by just saying that. Well, how does it work? Well, as we know, the browser will request from the server a certificate, well, for it to authenticate itself. Can you authenticate? Prove you are who you are. So that's mark number two. The server will send its certificate of authentication. That'll be mark number three. What will happen next is the following. Any data which is sent and they're authorized between the two uses encryption. This encryption, so that'll be mark number four, is going to be using asymmetric. So that is number five number six the browser will have the um, art galleries so the server public key in order to send data and then obviously the art gallery will use their private key to decrypt so that would be six marks in total so also make sure that we say once authentication is made on certificate then we can send data using encryption or two-way encryption so that will get you another mark seven so SSL security protocol browser requests a certificate well request the server to authenticate itself server will send their digital certificate or the certificate of authentication um, once it's been approved by the browser that is authentic they're going to do two-way um, encryption to send data. It's going to be asymmetric encryption. The art gallery will send their public key to the browser. The browser can then send their data to the server. The server then can use their private key to decrypt it. Okay, so I've got two questions here. So pause the video, give them a go yourself first. What is meant by TLS? and explain the two parts that make up TLS. So TLS 
is a security protocol, much like SSL. It actually is SSL, so it contains SSL. It's um, a successor to SSL. SSL actually isn't around or used that much anymore. So even HTTPS is TLS, but TLS has SSL in it. So it has better encryption, more modern. Output encryption algorithms. So it's a better version of SSL basically. So my next question is explain the two parts that make up TLS. Well, you've got the record and you've got the handshake. So let's go over this because we haven't done this for a long, long, long time. The record, actually let's do handshake first, it makes sense. The handshake is basically responsible for establishing a connection, or should I say secure, a little bit of secure connection, between browser and server. So this is where the certificate of authentication is done. This is where they agree on the encryption going to be used, the type of asymmetric encryption to be used. This is where they exchange public keys so they can talk to each other. So that is the handshake. So it's basically like, this is your browser, this is Netflix, Hey, how you doing? Hey, I'm good, how are you? Are you the real Netflix? Yeah, I am. Here's my certificate of authentication, or we call this also my digital certificate. Okay, that looks legit. Let's agree on how we're gonna to talk to each other in code so it's encrypted. Okay, let's use blah, 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 blah. That sounds good. So when we talk to each other, we can use this type of encryption. Awesome. Okay, I'm gonna give you my public key, and you're gonna give me yours. Awesome. That's where the handshake stops. The record is now responsible for the two-way conversation they have to make sure that everything is secure constantly. So when I basically say to Netflix, send me a movie, the record is responsible to make sure that it's encrypted and secure and everything like that. So it's responsible. Let me just erase this. For the secure transmission of data after the handshake. There you go. Pause the video, give this question a go yourself first. Okay, so Let's start off with symmetric. So symmetric uses one key to encrypt and decrypt data. Well, I could put the same key. Asymmetric. works by, I'm going to just put how it works, works by person A, I always do this, sending their public key to person B. Person B will send the data after it has been turned from plain to ciphertext to person A. 
person A, oh, using person A's public key. Person A can decrypt it using their private key. And the advantage of asymmetric is that uh, let's do this symmetric causes potentially a key distribution problem. If key intercepted. So if I was to draw that, symmetric would look like this. Person A will use their key, or a key, should I say? I'm figuring what a key looks like, there you go. To, de to basically scramble it up, to encrypt the data and the same key I'm just going to do that, is sent to person B. So person B uses the same key to decrypt back. If that key gets intercepted and the data get intercepted, someone else, a third party, can decrypt the information. That is symmetric and that's got a key distribution problem when that happens. Oh my god, what just happened to everything? Ah. I've actually just lost. Uh -huh. Okay. You then got asymmetric. If we have person A and they want to send a message to person B, step one is B will send their public key to A. A will write the message like hello and encrypt it using the public key of, A, of B. The message is then sent back to B B will use their private key, which is never sent and doesn't leave a computer, to decrypt the message. And that is asymmetric encryption. There are two keys used, so in our differences, we're using two keys, not one key. No key distribution problem. Okay, so Pause the video, give this question a go yourself first. So we're told we've got 64 bit symmetric encryption. How can we increase the level of security by this encryption? Well, don't say asymmetric encryption because it's wanting us to improve the symmetric encryption. So what we can do is we can increase the length, i.e. use 128 bits, for example, for the key. So this is a key, basically. 64 bits of binary numbers. By doing this, less chance of decryption, by brute force. So hear me out. If you intercept a key, oops, that's not a key, this is a key. This key is made up of bits. A hacker could then once they've intercepted it, use a brute force attempt to go for every combination of um, encryption code to find the correct one, gets it unlocked so we can actually read the document of what's being sent. But if you make it really impossible, so let's imagine you've got 128 different 
bit. I'm sure you mathematicians will be able to work out by how many different combinations you need to crack 128 bits versus 64 bits. The point being is you increase the length so you use more bits so imagine the keys is bigger and more complicated which means that it's harder for other people to copy or crack using brute force.